I am pleased to be hosting, uh, excuse me, moderating this extremely uh, illustrious panel on uh, ending marijuana prohibition and doing it through a racial justice lens. As many of you know, the unequal treatment of people of color in the criminal legal system is one of the most profound civil and human rights issues of our time. And it is extremely important that we start to look at what we have done in the past 25 years um, that has somewhat contributed to the, the um, highest rate of incarceration in the world and how we start to unpack and uh, repair some of those harms through legislative advocacy and policy making. I am pleased to introduce to all of you and welcome up to give some opening remarks the esteemed Congresswoman Barbara Lee from the <laughs> California's 13th Congressional District. Congresswoman Barbara Lee has been a champion of criminal legal justice reform for a, a very, very long time throughout her time in Congress and has co-sponsored and led, excuse me, sponsored several pieces of uh, legislation, the Marijuana Justice Act specifically, working to end prohibition at the federal level and increase equity in the system for everyone, especially people of color. Please welcome Congresswoman Barbara Lee. Thank you very much, Lakira, and thank all of you um, for being here today, and also thank um, Queen of DPA for her work in helping us put all of this together. And I just will be very brief, but I want to say to you that um, this is such an important issue, uh, and it's so important on so many fronts. And I think you laid out all the different, uh, secure, all the different complex legs that it has. But Senator Booker and I have worked very diligently on several bills, one of which uh, is our Marijuana Justice Act. And I wanted to just mention that bill because as you go back, and, and what I would like to do and make sure of is that during this week, you, you have what you need to take back to make sure your members of Congress support the efforts of the Congressional Black Caucus and what we are doing. And so our Marijuana Justice Act is one, one bill that is extremely important. I don't have the bill number. Do you know the bill number? Um, let me get the bill number for you. But what it does is basically it expunges all the records of those who have been convicted of marijuana charges. That needs to happen immediately. Secondly, it provides for a $500 million community reinvestment fund, which means that we will use federal funds to invest in communities most impacted by these unjust marijuana laws. Thirdly, it actually deschedules marijuana from the list of controlled substance, substances, which has to happen so that we can get rid of this federal prohibition. And um, it also makes sure that uh, our communities have the resources that are necessary to rebuild after they have been so destroyed by these terrible laws. African Americans, of course, are more like four times more likely to be arrested as a result of marijuana charges. Um, African Americans and Latinos make up nearly 80% of our nation's annual marijuana possession arrests. And so criminal justice reform is extremely important in this whole movement because it is a matter of justice for our communities. The, the war on drugs has failed, as you know, and um, our communities have been victimized by the war on drugs. And so it's about time that this country repair the damage. And so that's what the Marijuana Justice Act seeks to do. Secondly, we know that there are vi the, this is a trillion dollar industry and we're at the front end of this. Now, whether, now I always share the fact that I don't even drink wine, I've never smoked, and so <laughs> just know <laughs> this is still something that I'm very interested in and, and have been an advocate for since the days when I worked for our beloved Ron Delms because we saw then what was taking place. So this goes back to the 70s and the 80s. And so now we have states that have passed, 30 some states, marijuana, either medical marijuana, decrim, or uh, legalization bills. The genie's out of the box. It's not gonna go back in. 
And whether you agree or disagree, I want our communities to understand that this, the jobs that can be created and are being created and the economic development and growth out of this industry is enormous. And less, right now, less than 1% of the licenses go to African Americans in this trillion dollar business. So I introduced a bill, uh, now let me tell you what it's called. It's called the Realizing Equitable and Sustainable Participation in Emerging Cannabis Trade, better known as the RESPECT Resolution. Okay, so the RESPECT Resolution is about building equity in the cannabis industry. And now we have certain jurisdictions that have taken this resolution because it's very detailed and used it, even though it hasn't passed Congress, but they've used it as a roadmap for their local jurisdictions to begin to set up offices of equity for those who want to uh, apply for licenses. Of course, we're working now on many of the financial services <coughs> bills because we have to have legitimate banking services for this legitimate industry that has existed, that is existing in 30 some states now. So, that's another big piece of what we're working on. It's extremely important that our community gets out front on this. I, uh, as a result of wanting to do that and to, I won't say sound the alarm, but to beat the drum around the country, I accepted the position as co-chair of the Cannabis Caucus. There's never been, and it's bipartisan, <laughs> there's never been a woman <laughs> a person of color or an African-American co-chair in that caucus. But I did it for several reasons, uh, one of which is I wanted to make sure that the issues of concern to the black community and communities of color were a part of the mix of all of the bills that are really, quite frankly, moving now in a very positive direction. It's extremely important that we have Republicans, and I work, yes, with Don Young and some of the, our very <laughs> different Republicans <laughs> from us uh, on these issues, and, and they have come around to helping us. And of course, they care about uh, their states, you know, and for many, this is a states' rights issue. And so we've developed this, I think, very strong working relationship with, in a bipartisan way to get many of these uh, bills passed and through. We finally, thanks to our uh, warrior woman, Congresswoman Maxine Waters, who chairs the Financial Services Committee, we were able to get a banking bill out on cannabis just a couple of weeks ago. It should be coming to the floor very soon in a bipartisan way. So just know that your work and your help and going back asking your members of Congress to sign on, you're being out front, you're moving forward and helping us do this is going to help us win this victory for justice because that is exactly what it is. I will just say thank you to the panelists because now it seems like I'm seeing you all of the time and these sisters are really doing the work that needs to be done to make sure that everything that we're talking about today is done because you all are on the front line, you're visionaries, you are in the vanguard of this. And so I sincerely appreciate your being here and sharing your information and awareness and, and your work with, with everyone who has come today. And let me, let me just lift up my mother right now and, and conclude, because I've been sharing this story on the whole issue of medical marijuana. My mom passed about four years ago, and um, she was 90 years old, had COPD, but she um, had a knee replacement at age 86, did fine. When she turned 89 or 90, the doctor, her left knee was uh, bothering her. And uh, the doctor said, oh, I'm not sure about this knee replacement now. And, but she was in a lot of pain. She went out to those of you <laughs> in East Mont Mall, <laughs> and she was getting her little walker repaired, and she was complaining about her knee. And this sister next to her said, hey, honey, try this. And she tried it. It was some lotion. She came back and called me up. And she said, not only, because she knew I was supporting all of the issues around medicinal marijuana and, and marijuana justice, but she, but she called me <laughs> and watched that you better not only speak on behalf of any of these bills that are coming down, but you better fight for them and get your colleagues in the Black Caucus to speak on them and to support them. She said, because this stuff works. And, and, <laughs> and, and I would call her periodically and say, how's your knee? 
from the floor. And she would say to me, it's drunk. <laughs> and, and that meant no pain. And, and I share this story because it's, it's a humane kind of way of addressing uh, issues in our community, especially with senior citizens and those who have uh, pain and who are suffering and who only opioids may be the only option. And, and I've seen it, I've lived it with my mother, and I know that uh, we have to do this uh, also on behalf of those who uh, need medical care and health care and pain relief. And it certainly uh, is the real deal. So thank you all again very much. Thank you, Con thank you Congresswoman Barbara Lee, again, for hosting this panel and for those remarks. So we're going to jump right into this discussion. This is going to be a conversational style discussion. But at the end, we will provide time for all of you to ask the questions that you want to ask. There's a mic over here, so you just line up behind that mic and ask, and I'll call on you to ask your question. So I'm going to turn it over to our uh, panel of experts and advocates and allow them to introduce themselves in order as they are seated. And I'll open with a question to each of you just to allow you the opportunity to give some context to the work that you do and some of the issues that we are talking about here today. So first, we're going to start with Queen Adusi. Please tell us uh, your organization and your title and what you do there. And also, can you give us some of the specific ways that marijuana uh, prohibition and its enforcement has impacted people of color? Thank you, Sakira. Um, thank you, everyone, for being here. Thank you, Representative Barbara Lee. Uh, thank you to Senator Booker, who's not here. Um, and thank you to all the congressional members of uh, the CBC who have been fighting relentlessly. Uh, internally and externally for marijuana reform. Uh, so my name is Queen Adesui. I'm a policy coordinator with the Drug Policy Alliance um, with our National Affairs Office, which is our DC office. And we're a national advocacy organization working to end the war on drugs. So that's beyond just marijuana. It's really um, addressing all drug, drug use and drug enforcement, um, criminal justice reform, harm reduction, preventing overdose. Uh, so we're really working to really undo the war on drugs and its harms and repair its harms. Uh, so to address your question, um, the war on drugs and marijuana in particular has been used specifically to really uh, oppress uh, communities of color and people of color. Uh, we've seen decades of harm done to communities of color in particular. And when you think about marijuana reform and its, inf and, and its enforcement, um, the collateral consequences of for arrest and incarceration are so dire, in particular for people who are in vulnerable situations. So when you think about the harm, it's, it's really both individual and on the community level. So when someone is arrested for marijuana, uh, and depending on their life circumstances, that arrest and incarceration carries thousands of collateral consequences that complicates a person's life. So it, it, it impacts someone's ability to maintain their housing or secure housing, whether public or private, but especially public. Um, it it uh, interferes with someone's maintenance of their employment, securing employment. Um, there's a lot of discrimination when it comes to marijuana arrests, med um, medical marijuana patients. Um, any interaction with the plant itself can complicate someone's employment uh, security. It complicates vo voting. It complicates g even giving a driver's license in certain states still. Uh, certain states still are automatically suspending driver's licenses for drug, or drug offenses, even if it ha the offense had nothing to do with the car. I mean, the, the consequences are so deep um, and it impacts a, a person's ability to really maintain a family, maintain their own individual life and responsibilities. And that in turn affects families and communities, especially when you look at the way marijuana has been enforced in communities of color in particular. So black and brown communities um, for decades have been over enforced when it comes to marijuana. So disproportionately these communities have been impacted by these harms. So when we think about ending marijuana prohibition, it's it would be so tone deaf to really not consider the millions of people who have a marijuana arrest or incarceration history. Because continuing on after legalization, people are still impacted by those uh, arrests and incarceration. And barriers continue to remain, even in legal states. So it's really imperative for ad advocates and folks who are looking to end the war on drugs and end marijuana prohibition to remember to censor the people who bore the brunt of prohibition. Um, even on the business side, the fact that a person who has a marijuana conviction can be barred from the industry, someone who maintained the industry while it was um, prohibited, someone who has experience with the plant, 
um, people who have, you know, have gotten into selling or using marijuana for financial reasons, uh, to now realize, finally realize that marijuana use is not a criminal justice issue, it's more of a public health issue, to finally get to the place where we are now, where we're talking so compassionately about marijuana and drug use in general, um, especially in the wake of the overdose crisis where we're now speaking about drug use in a compassionate way, to now enter into a new industry from the front end and bar people based on arbitrary collateral uh, consequences from previous arrests is really absurd. So I'm really grateful for the leadership of people like Barbara Lee and Senator uh, Booker um, and other members of the CBC, including Representative Bonnie Watson and Coleman, who introduced a resolution calling for Congress to apologize for the war on drugs. Um, and then, you know, Representative Jeffries, who has also introduced legislation um, with Senator Schumer, who's come along and um, evolved on their positions around marijuana and its impact on communities. We really see that uh, post-legalization, post we need to focus on those who have been most impacted by marijuana. Thank you, Queen. Um, thanks for that um, really important overview because I think it sets the stage for the, the rest of our panelists. And a good segue to Gina Marone, who is from Women Grow. Gina, can you talk a little bit about how uh, marijuana prohibition impacts entrepreneurs and, and uh, especially people of color who are trying to enter the industry? Sure. Gia. 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 It's okay. So, sorry. Gia. so, but you got the last name, right? Yes, that was important, right? <laughs> If you haven't seen, it's spelled like moron, but there's an accent over the second O, which changes the pronunciation. Um, but once I speak, I think people know I'm not a moron. Uh, that said, uh, hi, my name is Gia Marone. I am the president of Women Grow. Uh, Women Grow is the largest um, professional network uh, for women in the cannabis industry. Uh, so it was launched in Denver, Colorado in 2014. Now since its inception, leadership has changed which means the company has changed. Uh, our mission is still to connect, educate, empower, and inspire the next generation of cannabis leaders. And that's what really drew me to the company overall. Um, the reason being is that I understand as an emerging industry, um, the pioneers are always important, but it's what comes behind the pioneers that are gonna continue to grow the industry. And so the challenges that are faced by um, entrepreneurs, uh, more specifically entrepreneurs of color, is lack of access to capital, right? Um, it's still a federally illegal industry, which means that we cannot go to banks. Uh, we often have to go to relatives, friends, and family, and even investors to invest in our businesses. Um, oftentimes, people of color are, um, let's just say going to friends and family for, uh, look, we know how it is when we gotta go to friends and family. Like, I'm trying to be politically correct, but um, it wouldn't, I wouldn't be myself if I wouldn't be direct. We, we struggle with, with finding financing for our businesses, which means oftentimes, just as Congresswoman said, and I want to thank um, all of the, the, the Congressional um, Caucus for allowing this opportunity to happen. Because a few years ago, we couldn't even have this conversation and here we are on a panel. So um, we're, we're grateful for this. Um, but that said, we're 1%, right, of, of ownership in this space. Whereas this is an industry that's already reached billions. Um, and what does that say for us? When it comes to investment opportunities, our businesses are receiving less capital than our, some of our other counterparts from other <coughs> cultural backgrounds. So where does that leave us continue to be behind? Uh, that said, with Women Grow, our mission is to see more women in the industry, not just only of ownership, but also in business. We're looking to see more women in leadership roles as well as on boards. Uh, it's interesting with another client, I was doing a press release with them and it stated that 6.6% of the women CEOs on Fortune 500 companies are women. Only one of the, one of the companies on that list of the Fortune 500, are, one is black. It's crazy, one. 
So of leading a Fortune 500 company, only one of them is African American. So if that's happening in other sectors, what does that say about cannabis? And the interesting part, and I'm going to go a little off from your question, oftentimes, I heard this brother when we were taking the picture, he says, wow, it's a panel of women, and I'm the only male. Well, that is rather common in, amongst African Americans in the cannabis industry. You're going to see more women than males. And so when we talk about the social injustice, unfortunately, many of our men are behind bars. So women are leading the forefront. Women are at the front of advocacy in the space. Women are pushing for legalization. Um, women are leading businesses. But our men are, are unfortunately not as present because they're behind bars. They're a little bit apprehensive about joining this industry. Why? Because of policing. So one of the things in terms of Women Grow is we wanted to do something, what can change the industry? What impacts can we make in addition to seeing more women in the forefront, more minorities? Well, we reached out to a faith-based community. So we partnered with the first church um, in the United States and globally in Brooklyn, New York, February 23rd to host the first cannabis conference. The reason why? We understand that the churches are the core of our communities. And if we don't start changing the conversation and tapping into what some of the hesitancy is, then we may once again be left behind. And so since that conference, which had over 400 people in attendance, Women Grow has continued to have conversations with faith-based leaders. Last Friday, Congresswoman Barbara Lee invited me out to Oakland, California to sit down with some bishops and pastors. And they wanted to know, we're in a legal state, yet in our city we have limitations in getting more minorities um, in uh, owning businesses or getting licenses. Well, that's not unusual. Although we're legal state to state, 33 states, uh, I think recreationally 11 states, um, that's just statewide. But when you go down to the city limitations, there are still restrictions. And unfortunately, many of us are not reflected in that ownership. And so what we realize is that we have to now start speaking to communities of which have been resistant, and we understand why, but we have to get beyond the resistance. In order for us to grow within this industry, we have to actually begin to start educating ourselves and re-educating ourselves, because this industry, which became illegal in 1937, but was very much a part of medicine prior to that, the course changed, and with that, it went into the faith community. With that, it went in much stronger within our judicial systems. So with Women Grow, our goal now is honestly to try and get more women in the industry, tapping into more women of color, but moreover, making sure that we as communities of color are not left behind. And when I say communities of color, I'm gonna be very specific, black and Latino communities. Because oftentimes, we sugarcoat people of color, but honestly, when you break that down and you begin to look at each culture, you'll see that, that black and Latino communities far, uh, represent far less. And it's unacceptable when our prison system is over capacity with that representation. So, you know, our goal now is to make sure that we are being very intentional about the business opportunities that we're doing, about encouraging more communities that are resistant to become more open. Um, and, and I wanna close on this front. In our being intentional uh, on Saturday, Women Grow hosted, and, and I'm plugging this because I need you to understand that we should no longer limit ourselves in what this industry can do. So on Saturday, um, September 7th in New York City, is New York Fashion Week. So we had our first official New York Fashion Week show on one of the big stages. So what does that mean? That means that we had to be accepted. Our application had to be accepted in order to do a full designer runway show, which was attended by over 500 people. Women Grow partnered with, um, I don't know if you all are familiar with Project Runway, but the designer Corteau Mamalu 
we, des we partnered with her to create a full high end to uh, athletic wear for us. Uh, and the reason being is that we needed to raise awareness. The one thing that we cannot do in this industry is we cannot promote, we cannot advertise, and our marketing is very restricted. So oftentimes when we hear that information isn't coming to our communities, it's oftentimes because we're being stopped and we're being limited. On social media, we are not allowed to promote. Facebook will shut us down. And so what can we do to do that? What we did is we took extreme measures and applied to have a full cannabis line in New York Fashion Week. I'm actually wearing one of the shirts now on purpose because part of that is, oh, want me to stand up? <laughs> so I say that to say, and I'm also wearing a piece of jewelry that was designed by uh, one, of the, uh, one of the designers for the show. And the reason being is we needed to normalize this. Part of the reasons that we're, um, many of the restrictions are coming or hesitancy is coming from our communities is that we haven't gotten past the stigma. So we also, ha also have to get out of our own way, and meaning our communities overall, to then begin to normalize this, have the conversation in schools, have the conversation in our churches, and begin to really raise awareness of the medicinal benefits, the financial benefits, and the reinvestments that can do, that can do wonders to our communities overall. I hope I answered yes, your Yes, absolutely. Thank you, Gia. Um, so that's a good segue to uh, Dr. Stanley Andreessen. I think I said that correctly. Um, Stanley, can you talk a little, introduce yourself, of course, but also talk a little bit about um, the impact, as, as uh, Gia alluded to, uh, on um, those who have been, in, you know, sort of directly affected by marijuana prohibition and um, share a little bit of your personal story. Sure. So. Uh, thank you all for attending, and thank you to Congresswoman Lee and uh, Senator Booker and their staff for putting this together. Uh, how's everyone doing this afternoon? Good? Okay, okay. So, you know, as was, as was mentioned, uh, when we took the photo over here, I was, you know, surprised. I guess I, I hadn't really thought about it when, you know, we were, you know, all the emails were going around uh, until I, I came and actually, you know, it's actually saw the panel. Um, so I, I'm obviously bringing a different and unique perspective, right? Because I'm sitting here uh, as, a, as a male, a black male amongst uh, all uh, beautiful ladies, intelligent, powerful, um, uh, you know, people that are making moves in their respective fields. So uh, for that, I'm, I'm honored and, and excited to be <laughs> uh, in, this, in this space. Um, but you know, I, I bring this this different perspective, right? Not only uh, as as a male, um, but I also bring bring a different perspective as well. So, uh, before I jump in, I want to just ask a quick question. So, when and and I, I want you to just uh, I want you all to just say what's on your mind. So I'm gonna ask a question, and I'm not gonna point at anybody. You know, everyone could just kind of start saying what they think. Um, so when you think of somebody who's been to prison, what is the first word that comes to your mind? Come on. Family. Black. Black. OK, I'm going to have to start pointing at folks. What do you think? First word that comes to your mind. That's not the first word, man. First word. Just say it. Crime. Why? Drugs. Injustice. What they do. <laughs> what color are they? What color? What about what about what about over in this back corner over here? What's your, what's the first word that comes to mind when you think of someone who's been to prison? Felony. Felony. Family member. Family member. Injustice. Injustice. Okay. Okay. That's so. When I, it, it really depends on the audience, right? Um, but one thing, you know, when I, I've done this experience, uh, you know, activity a couple times when, I, when I've talked, and, you know, about, if we were to really take the time, I don't want to take too much time, uh, but about 70% of the things that are said, first thing that you think about, 
Uh, many people have negative connotations associated, whether it's a negative word or it just brings about this negative feeling. Like even the word family member, you think about it, a family member who's, who's not with you, right? Um, so there is this, this negative perception of someone who's been to prison. And I, you know, I don't even, had I said the words ex-con or criminal or felon or convict, Right, that would have also triggered more negativity. I chose to say, you know, someone, a person who's been to prison, which already orientates you to like this humanistic type of aspect, right? Um, so, you know, I, I say that to say that I, you know, I'm of course uh, coming to this table from the perspective of being a formerly incarcerated person myself uh, with three felony convictions. So in my, in my early 20s, I was sitting in a courtroom facing 20 years to life in prison, and, and the prosecutor was pushing for life uh, because she felt that at that young age that, uh, the, that I had no hope for changing the decisions that I had been making up until that time. Um, and I was eventually sentenced to, to 10 years in prison. Um, Fast forward a little bit, I'm now Dr. Stanley Andrees, an endocrinologist, a scientist. <laughs> and a professor at uh, the number one HBCU in the country, Howard University right. College of Medicine. Uh, as well as a, an uh, adjunct professor at Johns Hopkins Medicine. Uh, and a visiting professor at Georgetown University College of Medicine. So uh, I would say that I probably changed a little bit from what this <laughs> prosecutor was uh, prophesizing all those many years ago. Um, but you know, what I want to really draw attention to is this idea of what it looks like to be uh, someone who's been to prison and the, the perceptions of people who have been incarcerated. Because uh, a lot of really what is driving what we are looking to do, what everyone at this table is looking to do, and what the uh, legislators who put this together are looking to do, are really change the perspectives and, and change the narratives around people who've been involved with the system. In particular, of course, here we're talking about people who've been involved with the system through the war on drugs. Um, so. I'm from uh, the Ferguson, Missouri area, which you know many people have probably heard uh, of Ferguson. I, I, I now live in Baltimore, which is you know also a very similar type of place. But growing up in Ferguson, uh, I made a number of poor decisions. I started selling drugs in my early teen years. I was arrested for the first time at 14. I was in and out of the juvenile system, uh, and you know I continued to make those poor decisions at an exponential rate to the point that I was, uh, you know, sitting in that courtroom um, with three felony convictions, two of which were class A drug trafficking charges. And, you know, the prosecutor painted this, uh, you know, this masterpiece of a painting, uh, you know, saying that I was, you know, she, she connected all these dots of this person started off with minor crimes and then has advanced uh, to where he is now with two class A drug trafficking charges and she felt uh, that I needed to go away for the rest of my life. Um, and, you know, I now, you know, so when I, when I was eventually sentenced uh, to, to 10 years and I was sitting in the courtroom and, you know, the, the, the judge gave her sentence, um, you know, it was almost as if it was this, this out of body experience for me. And I was like listening to, you know, looking at everyone in the courtroom as, you know, I was sitting there just, you know, in disbelief of, of what just happened. And it took me a second to come back uh, to myself. And, you know, when I, when I came back, the first thing that I wanted to do uh, was, was uh, you know, so I, I asked the judge, um, if I could go and hug my mother who was uh, in the courtroom. And uh, the judge denied me the, the chance uh, to give my mother one last hug before I went off uh, to, to, my, to, to start my 10 year sentence. And it was, um, and, and they immediately handcuffed me, uh, both my hands and my, and my, and my feet. 
and they took me away. And it was then just, you know, just immediately, um, there was this understanding that I'm no longer a person. You know, I don't even get the, the decency, the civility, the dignity that, uh, you know, you would give to uh, your fellow uh, person, right? Um, and that was, so that, that was the, the start of, of, this, of this journey. And for me, um, I went into it just having been told that I was this career criminal, so they, they tagged me with uh, being a prior persistent career criminal. And you know, I, I basically internalized that when I first uh, was you know, starting my sentence. And you know, it's only now that I know the brain is not even fully developed until someone is about what? In the mid 20s, right? Um, so I was you know, of this belief, I had been told and what was laid out seemed to make sense. Right, uh, I was fortunate enough to have this uh, person step into my life that saw a different trajectory for me and saw a different path and started investing in this potential that he saw in me. Um, and you know, long, you know, not to go into too many details, but when it was time for me to come home, I was convinced that uh, I wanted to continue my education. I applied to a number of universities and I was rejected from every single one except for the one where this mentor was on the admissions committee which was St. Louis University. So St. Louis University offered me this second chance. This mentor helped facilitate that second chance. I got into the program. I ended up completing uh, my, uh, ended up continuing my education, completing my PhD and MBA simultaneously in four years, which is a lot shorter than some other folks that I was in my similar programs with. And I say that not to say that, you know, I was something, um, you know, it, it was more so this hunger and this thirst and drive for change. Um, so now, you know, fast forward, I ended up going to Hopkins, ended up moving on to Howard University as a professor at the College of Medicine. Um, and eventually I ended up starting this organization called From Prison Cells to PhD, and we run a program called Prison to Professionals. And what I've, you know, we have about 100 people or so that run through, 100 or so currently and formerly incarcerated people that run through our program each year. We help them by providing resources, tools, and support to help them navigate uh, their ways into and completing higher education. And our average GPA is, is 3.75. Um, it's, it's not just me, you know. It, I'm not this anomaly. Um, everyone in our program has that same drive, that same hunger, that same thirst. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I mentioned that, and of course how I tie into this is that, you know, we need to be letting people like myself and people like the folks in our program into this, uh, into this industry, right? Um, and I, I say that not only because, you know, of all the things that have been mentioned already, uh, but I say that because we have all the talent and potential to really push this field in a new, you know, in, in a new direction, in the direction that needs to be going, in the direction that is fruitful for everybody, you know? So it's not that we're trying to give out handouts. These, you know, we're qualified, mm -hmm. right? We're, we're sometimes overqualified and, um, you know, we really need to push this idea of reinvestment. And part of that reinvestment really needs to be in the form of education. Because although I tell, you know, I was, you know, I'm going inside to the prison facility that we're at later tonight and I, you know, I tell, the, you know, we're at a men's facility and I, and I tell the brothers that, you know, you have all this, the street skills that you have. We go through this experiment that's called criminal skills. We ask, we ask them like, go back into your criminality and tell us all the things you were doing when you were in your criminal thinking. And we fill up an entire board of skills. And then, you know, as maybe you guys might imagine, we end up telling them these are all transferable skills, right? They have all the skills and talent they need to be leading a boardroom table that's closing a million, billion dollar deal. They have what it takes to be successful in the classroom, but you know, you don't get a certificate from the School of Hard Knocks, right? You don't get a certificate from the streets. So you can't show that to nobody, right? You got all these skills, but nobody's gonna believe that you really have it. Sometimes they don't even believe me, so, you know? So we need these, we need that piece of paper. And, and part of the reinvestment to me is uh, looking to reinvest in education. Um, and, and you know, that's how we will help move people into this industry. Um, and I know I'm taking up probably more time than I, than I should, 
Uh, so I'll end there, and I'll, I'll, I'll save the rest for later. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Andrew. And that, I mean, this is amazing, because all of the panelists um, uh, so effortlessly helped me segue into our next uh, uh, colleague on the panel, and I'm going to turn to uh, Shanita Penny who's the president of Minority Cannabis Business Association. Um, and Shanita, one of the things that Dr. Andres brought up in, uh, in his remarks was um, the, the importance of equity, right? The importance of bringing more equity to the industry, more equity to the, to the conversation around marijuana, pro, ending marijuana prohibition. Can you introduce yourself and talk a little bit about how states, what states have and have not done? to ensure equity when they have moved to um, reform their marijuana laws. Sure, good afternoon everyone. My name is Shanita Penny. Um, I transitioned my consulting business to serve the cannabis industry almost five years ago. Prior to that, I was in supply chain management for Fortune 500 companies and eventually went on to uh, do software consulting. What I understood immediately was that this industry was one that I could apply everything I had done in my previous life without reinventing the wheel. Um, I was then uh, awakened to the advocacy side of things as I was getting into business. And what I quickly understood was as someone who had had a relationship, a personal relationship with this plant for so long, um, was that I took for granted some of the opportunities that came pretty easily to me very early on. As I was taking clients through the licensing process in Maryland, I found out very quickly that it didn't matter how qualified you might be, how much access to capital that you might have, that you just weren't politically connected in this country to do the things that this industry is requiring. And so for me, um, it only took I mean, it took less than six months for me to understand that I needed to connect with like-minded individuals um, on the industry side of things, but that I also needed to connect with advocates that could help me understand what exactly we needed to do to really have a, a chance at this. And so getting involved with the Minority Cannabis Business Association opened my eyes to our power as a people. And it opened my eyes to the power of the Congressional Black Caucus. And so I'm very excited that after several years of kind of hovering around this space, that we have a, a, a place to talk about cannabis as it relates to criminal justice reform and as it relates to equity in general, not just in the industry. I am over cannabis companies talking about hiring you know, diverse folks. That's the minimum. That's what you have to do. <laughs> I am tired of you talking about, you know, well, when we get to this point, then we'll come back and address this issue. No more of that. We have commitments from our leaders like Congresswoman uh, Lee. We, as the MCBA, have taken the respect resolution and created model legislation that is ready to be implemented and has been implemented in various places throughout the country. When you look at states like Massachusetts that from a state perspective has said, we are going to start with equity. We are going to prioritize folks in communities that have been impacted and we're going to lend resources to these programs. Uh, we also have uh, Illinois recently who as they have now legalized adult use are using the existing medical industry to help fund some of the equity programs that will take place in that state. For me as a part of the industry, it is not only an honor but a privilege to be involved in the discussions around equity, to have a seat at the table to talk about how cannabis tax revenue should be deployed, to bring awareness to our legislators about organizations that are already in our communities addressing you know, deficiencies as it relates to healthcare, education, uh, access to healthy foods, all of these things. And now we just need to take it a step further and really hold the industry accountable for doing what's right as it relates to equity in our communities and equity in the industry itself. Thank you. And last but certainly not least, I'm gonna turn to my colleague, uh, Maritza Perez. Uh, Maritza, can you talk a little about, introduce yourself of course, but talk a little bit about 
Um, you know, Congresswoman Barbara Lee talked about the Marijuana Justice Act, the Respect Act, um, but there are a, a number of other pieces of legislation at the federal level that will accomplish the goals that all of our panelists have talked about, equity, uh, clearing records, reinvesting tax dollars in communities, and ensuring access for those in the business who, are, who have less access, right, to both capital, but also um, are, who are coming from the communities who are most harmed and been impacted. Can you talk a little bit about uh, the opportunities there, specifically the MORE Act? and what uh, all of our colleagues in the audience can do to help legislators um, push for and make sure that that bill passes this Congress. Yeah, of course. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Maritza Perez. I'm with the Center for American Progress. Um, CAP is a progressive organization, a progressive think tank that works on um, several domestic policy issues. We have a small but um, robust criminal justice team, which I'm a part of. Um, we work on a variety of issues. My portfolio includes um, marijuana policy as well as policing, prison and sentence reform, and other issues related to the criminal justice system. Um, but I will say that the marijuana work has been the most exciting for me and the one that I'm most passionate about because for me, I've always seen it as a racial justice issue. The reason that we got into marijuana in the first place, um, CAP as an institution, but specifically on my team, was that we saw that marijuana, you know, as the Congresswoman mentioned, it's moving. We just want to make sure that now it's moving and becomes legalized that states, cities, and the federal government does it in the right way. So we thought we could be a leader on that and show by producing something at the, at the federal level how states and cities could be doing it. Um, so we've been working alongside other organizations, including the Leadership Conference, uh, the Drug Policy Alliance, um, and other drug, drug policy groups, civil rights groups, and advocacy groups um, in a coalition. Uh, we've dubbed ourselves the Marijuana Justice Coalition, and um, our job has really been to make sure that as marijuana is being legalized, we're being intentional about the racial justice aspects of it. Um, so uh, we, were we were successful in working alongside Chairman Nadler of the House Judiciary Committee to introduce um, the MORE Act, the Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment Expungement and Opportunity, Marijuana Opportunity Reinvestment and Expungement Act, MORE Act. Um, we, we were successful in introducing that um, this summer. Prior to that, we actually had a historic hearing on the Hill. It was the first time that we discussed marijuana reform at the same time that we were discussing racial justice and while, while we had to do both and why we had to address both. And um, it was actually really well attended by both sides of the aisle, which really showed that people now, including lawmakers, agree that marijuana legalization needs to happen, right? but we need to push for them to do it the right way. And that's where the discussions are now. Um, so I'll tell you guys a little bit about the bill um, because it addresses a lot of the things that we've touched on here. Um, so first and foremost, the bill would remove marijuana from the list of controlled substances, um, which would be huge. It would make marijuana legal at the federal level. Um, it would also provide resentencing and expungement opportunities for people who have um, records and people who are still under the criminal justice system because of um, a marijuana conviction. In addition to that, it would require the government to collect uh, data on the industry, so collecting data on how diverse or not diverse the industry is in order to start to remedy that. Um, and it would also disallow the government uh, from denying people federal benefits based on marijuana use. So for example, if you use marijuana use, or if you uh, were to use marijuana or had a conviction, the government then couldn't take away benefits like SNAP or um, couldn't deny you from a, from a job just because of that past use. Another provision that we put in there was um, disallowing immigration consequences for marijuana use. Um, so there was actually a really great report um, not too long ago on the immigration consequences of marijuana use. Um, a study by the Human Rights Watch found that between 2007 and 2012, more than a quarter of a million people were actually deported for marijuana law violations. Um, and the vast majority of these deportations that happen based on marijuana are for simple possession. Um, and you know, I, I will tell you, as somebody who has a family member who is currently incarcerated, who is a non-citizen, like when that family member is done with their sentence, that person will be deported. Like that is like the most like final like sentence that you can ever place on a family. Um, so I'm really excited that we put something about immigration in this bill because it does have a huge impact on people. Um, but I would say like probably the biggest part of the bill and the part that we're most excited about as a coalition um, is the, um, 
the, the three grants that were, re so we created a trust fund for marijuana revenue that would be um, distributed among three different grants. So one grant um, was borrowed heavily from um, um, a, a bill that the congresswoman actually was, <laughs> that she, she introduced. So the Marijuana Justice Act um, is a really great bill that included um, robust, uh, robust programming for communities that have been most harmed by the war on drugs using marijuana tax revenue. So we modeled um, part of our bill after that. So we would use marijuana tax revenue to fund services in communities that have been most harmed by the war on drugs. This includes expungement services, um, legal services, job training, um, youth development, that sort of thing. And then the other two grant programs are related to the business side of marijuana. Um, so both of these grant programs would be administered under the Small Business Administration. One grant program would go to support um, minority-owned and women-owned cannabis business owners, and the other grant program uh, would uh, provide incentives for states to implement equitable, equitable licensing in their, in their jurisdictions. So one thing that folks on this panel have talked about is that if you have a record or if you're a person of color from a low-income background, often you don't have the capital that, be, that you might need to even get started in the industry. So we're hoping with this grant program, we can encourage states to actually diversify who the license holders are. Um, so that's the bill that, that we've really been focused on um, at the federal level. We um, are asking that uh, Congress consider this bill for a floor vote in the fall. We're asking for a swift markup of the bill. So a markup just means that the, the members of Congress will look at the bill um, to get it ready for actual, to an actual stage where it could be voted on on the floor. Um, and what's exciting to us is that in our conversations on the Hill, it seems that lawmakers, lawmakers know that, the, that marijuana uh, legalization is gonna happen. The big question now is how? And you all are at this panel, so I'm assuming that you all are behind the sentiment that we feel, which is that any, any marijuana legalization bill that comes down, um, down to a floor for the vote in Congress needs to start with racial justice or social justice. For far too long we've seen, um, we've been told to wait for far too long. You know, our communities are always told, well let's do this first, let's do that first, and then eventually we'll get to the issues that you all care about. And what we know is that never happens. So we wanted to make sure that we, we included racial justice at the forefront because otherwise we're afraid it won't get addressed. So what you all could do is, um, you know, contact your members of Congress, tell them that you support the MORE Act. The MORE Act needs to be voted on and needs to be considered. There are a lot of marijuana bills in Congress right now, but I am telling you that none of them are as comprehensive as this bill. None of them address the root of the issue that we've been talking about, which is legalization, um, but also implementing robust racial justice programming. This is the one bill that does that. So. Again, I would encourage you all to contact your members of Congress, ask them to push for the MORE Act. Thanks, Maritza. Uh, Queen. Um, so Queen, has, as Maritza noted, has been working side by side um, with uh, many in the coalition to work on this bill, and I think you want to add yeah. a little bit more. I just wanted to add just a quick plug to what Maritza was talking about. Another really important part of the MORE Act and why we're really asking folks to push this on your members is that it was introduced in the House by the House Judiciary Chairman, uh, Jerry Nadler from New York. Um, and his introduction of this bill is a great signal that that committee would take this uh, issue seriously and he takes it seriously. So we need folks to hit up their, their members of Congress and have their members of Congress so co-sponsoring this bill and pushing this bill so we can actually get a swift vote um, on the bill, so. Thanks, Queen. So I'm gonna, uh, we've heard a lot about the historical context of marijuana and the impact that it has on communities, um, the collateral consequences associated with a conviction for not only uh, marijuana, but a, a conviction probably for many drugs, um, but also, and then also the impacts that it has on people who are trying to enter the industry and some of the barriers um, so I want to open it to you all, because we've educated you enough, and hear from you your questions about the issue, this issue broadly. If you can uh, step to the mic there, and I'll call on you as you um, go there. And Dia, uh, Emma will help um, facilitate I will, I will that. also do the roving. Like. She can also rove. So if you just yeah. want to stay in your seat and raise your hand, she'll come to you with the mic, and ask, you can ask your question. Thank you. Uh, 
Can you share that bill number with us, please? Of um, the MORE Act? Yeah, I'll look it up for you right now. Okay, and also I know Congresswoman uh, Lee said she would come back and share the bills that she's pushing, yes. the bill numbers as well. Yes, we will share those bill numbers. We can look it up really quickly. But I want to note that Congresswoman Barbara Lee is a sponsor of the MORE Act as well. Okay. Uh, so the Marijuana Justice Act has, was a, her bill that she talked about initially. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yes, it's right here. Uh, the Marijuana Justice Act uh, sort of was the impetus behind the MORE Act. And so many of the provisions in the Marijuana Justice Act were transferred to the MORE Act. Um, and she is a, a big supporter of that piece of legislation as well. And so I will just run down the list. Marijuana Justice is uh, HR 4815. HR is House. Um, and then S1889, which is the Senate. Um, the uh, Respect Act, which the Congresswoman mentioned earlier, is H Resolution 163. And the MORE Act is HR 3884. The MORE Act is HR 3884. Thank you. Thank you. I think there's a question. Hi. Um, I'm really happy to hear about the legislation that's moving forward. I'm looking at the flip side. Um, when I walked in this room, my son was an equity partner. After I walked in this room and I showed him where I was, he, he said four minutes ago, I just gave back my license. Um, my observation is this. California, Oakland especially, we have these, you know, we have these great programs and this opportunity. If you had, had been arrested for marijuana, then you had priority status to become an equity partner, which is where you have a partner who may be a large business and they're supposed to support you with your rent and payments and things like that. It all sounds good on paper, but when I'm, when I'm talking about what you initially say about the, the bottom line, the few people are involved. So I've watched for the past eight months as they've worked 12 hours a day and not taken a salary but paid, paid the, um, the employees, which is great. But they need so much support. One of the things that, um, it's like for drivers, they have to pay them $35 an hour. They have more restrictions for drivers of cannabis than they do for drivers of people in automobiles. Uber, Lyft, they don't have those restrictions. So you're already putting them now at a deficit. First you've got to find somebody who can drive for you. And, then that, and, that's, and that's a challenge. But the thing that bothers me the most as a mother is the issue around the banking, which is absolutely imperative. It's that for someone who has a legal business, my son is always going, Mom, compliance, compliance. I'm worried about compliance. I've got to make sure we do everything. But then compliance, accountants and all that, they're very new to the industry. And, and so until we have more people who are trained in that area, it's nerve wracking for people who could sell pot without all of this to try to do it in a, in a manner that is legal. But the thing that concerned me the most, again, is, as a mother, is the banking part because they can't put the money in the bank. So after all of that work and all of that, if you put the money in the bank, the bank could just take all of that away because still technically it is not legal. That's one point just to hear that. But what that means is that drivers can be robbed because they're dealing with cash. And that's what happened. And I think it shook them all up so much because the driver was an ex-Marine. And, and so being in that position where you have cash, so people go onto the website, order their stuff, and then they, ro they can rob you when you get there. So that piece ha really has to be a priority, and also the assistance in holding these equity partners accountable, because at this point, he's saying now, years gone, only three months of the equity partner being held accountable because he had to go and report them. So now he's just like, I'm going to separate. I'm just not going to do this at all. So even when we have it, let's not look at those statistics and saying, okay, we're moving forward. We gotta really look closely at how do we keep those very, very few to, um, where they're still in it so that they can reach back and help others later. But this is something very, very new all the way around the compliance, the laws, the rules, all of these things that they have to do. And the worry does not leave with that. And so how we can support all of these who want to come up, you know, I'm just, I'm arguing with him back and forth. And he says, no, I'm done. You know, I've always been able to survive this. But this is a place where people are calling them every day and asking them, offering them money to buy their license. So to walk away has to, it, it sends a very strong message. No, thank you. Thank you for that. I, I'm going to ask uh, Queen and Marissa to take the first part of that question about the banking issue and how 
we can address the banking issue. And then Maggie turned to Gia and asked, she needed, yes, about the equity license. The, the Safe Banking Act is our, is what is most critical to all of us right now. As an industry, we need it. Um, four years ago, folks didn't have access to banks like they do today, and it's still a very real public safety issue. Um, so your concern isn't lost on any of us, especially in the industry. Um, that should be up for a vote very soon. If you're talking about what we can do today, it is to make sure that when that uh, bill comes up for a vote on the House floor that you are um, talking to your elected officials and making sure that they're voting for safe banking. Safe banking not only gives the industry access, but it also gives resources to those social equity and economic empowerment programs throughout the country. Um, I, I know this situation firsthand because of the lack of access to institutional lending. You do have a lot of predatory uh, lending and partnering going on. Uh, in the state of California, it varies from city to city what that general partner has to do for you. In the city of Oakland, the minimum requirement is a thousand square feet of space to work in. That means you don't have to mentor, you don't have to offer any financial assistance, all of the things that are critically needed, and then these business owners are left hanging. And oftentimes, in a worse financial position, with that, you know, equity license um, than they were to begin with. And so, it is incumbent upon us that we, yes, have safe banking. Um, but then again, we have to come together as a community and be the resources that each of us need mm -hmm. to acquire the license, to maintain the license, to thrive. Even if one of us goes out today and gets a license, we're competing against multi-state operators. Right, that are valued, and I don't have full confidence in these valuations, but these companies are, 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 are being valued in a billion dollar range. Right, so now you go get your one license, and who are you competing against? Yeah, Mr. I got 20, Mr. I got 400. And, and everybody thinks you're full of money, so all of the Everybody wants some. Everybody that's qualified is overcharging three, four, five times. And to remain compliant and to maintain safety that we're dealing with right now, we're spending more money than most of us have access to. So when you hear the stories about these uh, larger operators bleeding millions of dollars, they were funded to bleed millions of dollars. We don't have that luxury. So we have to be smart and resourceful and do better business once we finally have the opportunity to do it. Can I just say tomorrow morning, I don't know which room we're in, um, but there's a cannabis and banking session from 9.30 to 11. So I encourage you to come if you can. I just wanted to add the main reason why banking services is such an issue is because marijuana is a scheduled drug. And the only way to, to really fix that issue is to deschedule, which unfortunately the Safe Banking Act does not do. Um, it includes fixes, but the, the real way to end the issue with banking services is to actually deschedule marijuana which um, the comprehensive bill that we were just talking about, the MORE Act, includes descheduling. So descheduling effectively fixes all of the major issues when it comes to marijuana prohibition. It, it allows for research, um, which is a huge problem that we don't have. It allows for veteran access to medical marijuana, um, which no matter if you're in a legal state or not, does not it does not allow for veterans to, to access medical marijuana without um, marijuana being removed from the controlled substance list. Um, it just allows for an array of issues to be solved immediately just from removing marijuana from that list. Thank you. Thanks, Queen, and thanks, Shanita. I see another question over here. Oh, wait, somebody already had some money. Hi. Afternoon, everybody. Uh, my question is, you know, I guess I'm assuming most, if not all, people have had an interaction with marijuana in this room. But for generations, we've been lied to about effects of marijuana the research that wasn't actually legal to do. And so my parents have lied to me under the, you know, the auspices of what their parents told to them. So my question becomes, how do we, the minority, one, two percent of the whole country, start to bring the rest of them along and say, listen, the things that you heard are not necessarily true. And the things that we do need to learn, we need to learn together. But to just assume that the bad, because we hear it all the time, how society is crumbled because of the marijuana policies or the marijuana use of all these people when we know that this is not true. So I just wanted to know you guys' opinion on that. So, so, 
One of the points that I think any of us can agree to here is, of course, education, and that is the. How's that? Okay. Uh, the one reoccurring theme, no matter what cannabis or marijuana panel, however you choose to say it, um, you'll hear education over and over. Uh, and the reason why is we do have to become re-educated. Even our own doctors have to become educated about this. Um, what's interesting now, and one of the notes that I made to myself, is that when we begin to see higher education now creating programming around cannabis, we know that we have to take it more seriously. One of the things, uh, I think is what, the University of Maryland that just started a graduate program for cannabis, um, which I had said a couple years ago, I said if we don't begin to look at the education, and I'm talking about that next generation that's coming in, because we can do all of this work, but if we don't prepare our own children, then we're falling, it's falling on deaf ears. That said, Southern University in Fort Valley in Georgia are the only two HBCUs that have licenses, uh, which I think is really important because our HBCUs, many of them have ag agricultural programs, um, which is critical for our children. But in addition to that, we need our children to also consider the sciences, the English majors. And I sat around and I spoke with a bunch of um, parents and I said, how interesting would it be that you sat there and you actually told your child, consider a career or a business in cannabis. Consider getting, getting a degree in that space. I would love to see our HBCUs actually focus on this, and I think it's important. The fact that Southern actually was the first HBCU in the country to have a license, they're in a position where they can actually educate our own children, right, so that not only what they're doing in terms of cultivating for the state, because that's what they're doing currently right now, but that we then can provide our own research and study our own illnesses. We can then provide, perhaps these are the next innovators to whom whatever is possible in this space. So I agree, education is key, and I think it's not just for the young generation, but it's for all of us, even our seniors. Yeah, I just wanted to say real quickly about that, that that's, that's a really great question, but if you think about the history of just the war on drugs, it's not surprising that people still are really miseducated on not just marijuana, but all sorts of drugs. I mean, marijuana itself, the word was literally created to demonize Mexican migrants at the turn of the century in the 1900s, and the word still carries a lot of I mean, it's historically racist, but it still carries a stigma. I, mean, I think now with our generation, that's kind of going away, but we have to remember that you know this was really intentional. It was, it was created to stigmatize people of color and to criminalize people of color. Um, but what I do find actually really encouraging is that people are changing their minds. You said that maybe one or 2% of us are on this side, but it's actually more than that. And, and you'll find that as you talk to more people. So. CAP, uh, my organization, did polling on this, and we found that um, on both sides of the aisle, people uh, across genders, races, all of that agree that marijuana should be legalized, um, the majority, right? So like, there's a, there's a huge swath of people who actually do think it should be legalized for a variety of reasons, maybe for racial justice reasons, maybe for medical reasons, maybe for business purposes. I'm not sure what their reason is, but I do think there is a cultural shift. Um, so we should really just like throw ourselves behind that momentum. Dr. Andres, do you want to add something? I mean, I, I feel like it's all been said. I, I don't know if I could add to uh, what, what has already been mentioned, but I did want to, on the topic of education as a whole, which is you know what I can comment on, in terms of education of uh, marijuana stigmas and, policy, and, and, and policies and research and that nature, I can't really speak to that, but one thing, you know, for education as a whole, as a way of reinvestment, as I was mentioning earlier, uh, so, how many? I'm gonna, I'm gonna go back to the question. It's the, it's the professor in me, I guess. But I'm gonna poll the audience again. So, how many of you? Uh, so, what would you say is the percentage of people who are formerly incarcerated that have a high school diploma or a GED? Five percent. Just, just shoot out some numbers. Twelve. Formerly incarcerated people with a high school diploma or a GED. 
So the number is is 75, uh, 75%. And, and I noticed that most people, when again, I do a lot of like the polling stuff when I speak, and I, I pop the, you know, the audience response. And most people think that it's actually lower. Uh, most people think it's like in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. It's actually 75%. And the number of for the general population is 90%. So it's only about a 1.5 fold difference. It's actually pretty close. This. The, the, the system has actually done an intentional job of closing that gap. So now the next question is, what is, uh, what do you think the percentage of formerly incarcerated people with some form of post-secondary education attainment? Okay, I don't know. 40, 50, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, 40, and for the general public, uh, it's a little over 35%, right around 35%. So it's about a nine-fold difference in post-secondary education. So to the point of education, you know, in terms of higher education, uh, you know, the system is very intentional. Like when I was, I was incarcerated in the state of Missouri, um, it was required in order to get paroled that you have completed your GED or uh, be, you know, some percentage done with your GED. So it was, there was a line item in the Department of Corrections that provided GED training. There's not that for higher education, right? And there's a nine-fold difference. Um, and so, you know, one thing that I, that I want to plug is this idea that we need to be reinvesting in education. That's part of how we uh, start uh, this restorative justice process, in my opinion. Um, and, and one of the things, you know, one of the bills that I want to plug and events that I want to plug uh, is an event. So we, so uh, my organization is part of a coalition of forces called Unlock Higher Ed. So Unlock Higher Education is a, a coalition of uh, nonprofit organizations that are led by formerly incarcerated leaders, and uh, you know we're carving out this space of being the voice for formerly incarcerated individuals in, in, in the space of education justice. And so we have an event coming up uh, next Tuesday. So I, I want you all to either pull out your phones and put, you know, write it on a piece of paper. Uh, and we're partnering with law enforcement leaders. So we, we are partnering with uh, what would maybe some people would think are unlikely partnerships. We partnered with the uh, uh, Association for Correctional Administrators uh, a while back who are also pushing to support uh, Pell Restoration. So I won't go into all of the details of it, um, but essentially this is a way to reinvest in educating individuals who are incarcerated, which was removed about 20 years ago due to the war on drugs and the tough on crime policies. Um, so uh, the bill, if I know everyone's interested in bill numbers, it's called the real act. Yeah, I'll, I'll get a bill number for you. But uh, Tuesday, this Tuesday from two to three, we're holding a uh, briefing in partnership with Senator uh, Schatz and uh, Bobby Scott. Um, so I encourage you all, if you're interested, to learn more. Uh, definitely, to, and if you're in the D.C. area, we would love to to see you there. Thank you. I see another. Oh, Mike here. Okay. Hi, um, my name is Eric Foster. Now, pass it on. I work in the space of consulting to businesses that are going for licensing and working with the governmental sector in regards to opting in and what the ordinances and statutes are. There were a couple things that I wanted to make note of though. While we don't have the banking system that we need, we do have two things that do allow banks to currently, and there's 461 that do, banks and credit unions. There's a 2014 FinCEN guideline from the Department of Treasury that spells out the specific requirements for s suspicious activity reporting that banks have to do, know your customer, and other compliance points to allow them to do business with marijuana businesses. Now, lending is something that none of those businesses, none of those banks do, but other banking services exist. And then there was a reinforcement uh, 2015, January, from the Federal Reserve Bank. It was a FISA letter that gave additional clarity and guidance on 
that sort of banking and the reporting back to the Federal Reserve. Now the Cole Amendment, of course, would have helped with a lot of that. That's gone, but those two are still in place. Secondarily, on research, Maryland, Massachusetts, Pennsylvania, and California has a act right now that's moving through the legislature that allow for research. Pennsylvania, especially the chapter 19 and 20, their medical marijuana research acts, universities are able to become clinical registrants along with licensees and they are partnering and doing studies. Right now, Thomas Jefferson and Philadelphia University along with three or four licensees are doing active studies on autism, sleep disorders, depression, and cancer as it relates to medical marijuana. So within the states, the states can create the legislation to push for research and can also, as Oregon has done and a few other states have done, create at least on a state level additional laws to codify and protect the banks within their jurisdiction that do business as well with medical and recreational marijuana businesses. But what I wanted to also add too, and just ask this question, because we're dealing with this in Michigan on expungement, in both the medical and recreational laws, expungement was not addressed. Now there's separate bills that are moving to address expungement, but there's not a direct linkage in the statutes that are on the books that would codify the expungement so that now you don't have a disqualifying <coughs> mark for being an employee or for being a licensee. I think the hope is that, well, just the expungement will cover it, but our thoughts are that uh, from a policy standpoint, you need to put that in also into the statutes. So my question would be, as you all are looking at this, what are the those components of not just looking at expungement, but also then going back in and drilling it into the governing statutes that allow for medical and recreational marijuana in these individual states? I mean, you, you brought up a great point. So Illinois, for example, uh, until last year, if you had a cannabis conviction, you could not participate as a patient in the program, and they had to go back and course correct. And so ideally what we're gonna see happen in the future is what we see now in Illinois, where you know 770,000 records are, are eligible to be um, expunged when this legislation takes effect. So we wanna see that happening at the onset, and we wanna see language and resources that take the burden off the person who's already carrying this, right? And that burden really exists on the victim uh, of the criminal justice system as well as the municipality um, because if you're in a state like California or even a state like Pennsylvania from city to city and county to county, the process is different, right? And so we do wanna see states move towards including this language and a thoughtful process around how this is actually executed that doesn't, um, so that the burden doesn't remain on the individual that's already been impacted. Um, I'll just add, uh, historically, like, as legalization started to roll out, there wasn't special care or centering around criminal justice reform. So we've seen the first states that legalized having to go back and fix that. And I mean, DC was the first jurisdiction to even campaign around legalization, around racial justice. So now we're starting to see states trying to do this the right way from the front end, which is really beautiful to see on the federal level, uh, these conversations also happening. So the federal level, you know, mirroring what states should be doing in their states. And that's why, again, like, it's really wonderful to see uh, legislators coalescing around a bill that's as comprehensive as the MORE Act. And just to piggyback on your, the beginning of your question around uh, some of the workarounds in certain states around banking, around research, all of those solutions are great in the meantime, but they're all subject to federal like, inter interference. So the real way of fixing this is not a Band-Aid, it's really descheduling. 
And the concern around uh, you know, pushing one bill over the other really lies on the fact that Congress tends to take one bite at the apple when they address issues. So now that we have all of this you know, support and commitment and what seems like momentum around marijuana on the federal level, when we get that first stab, that one chance, the potential one chance at uh, Congress voting on a marijuana bill and passing a marijuana bill, the hope is to have it be a bill that's as comprehensive as the MORE Act and actually lays the groundwork, the roadmap for what states should be doing on the local level. Thank you. So we're nearing the end of our time and I see a couple of hands. I'm gonna take three questions, yeah, all at the same time. So you have the mic. <laughs> um, I, the lady in the back had her hand up for a while, so I'm gonna let you with the mic go, come to you right here and then you, okay, go ahead. All right, I'm sorry, I'm gonna try to be quick. Yes. Um, my name is Dave, uh, I live in DC. Um, I kind of want to piggyback on what Brother Gregory was asking. Uh, me, myself, I'm an entrepreneur, I'm an advocate. I've been in the industry for four or five years from the ground level up. Um, I've worked for, my main focus is to get people the products they need uh, from an organic level when it comes to TAC, CBD. I've tried to educate myself um, on a, a number of platforms. I'm currently trying to finish my undergrad so I, um, at the Robert Smith uh, Business School in Maryland so I can enter the, gra the cannabis graduate program there. So say a prayer for me in that. Um, but personally, I understand where you're coming from in terms of education. Me personally, I've had to do that with my family and my church family. Um, I go to the Montgomery County Church of Christ in Maryland. I have people that come to me silently asking for information, products to deal with real ailments, cancer, prostate cancer, um, Question. everything. My question is, with someone like me, I put my own resources and money into getting these materials for people, but as you said, Miss uh, Shanita, you're going against people that have deep pockets that they're pushing their products that may not be beneficial for people. I wanna know how someone that is doing the steps to properly educate and put himself in a position that can get with people that can help fund these efforts. For me, I've traveled to Canada to get RSO, to get concentrated full spectrum CBD to bring people not looking for a profit, but I'm actually feeling like I'm running out of avenues. And while you guys are doing an amazing job to push legislation and doing that work on that, on that aspect, there are people out here that are actually trying to get people medicine so they can live another day, they can live another week, they can live and have a, a decent, a, a high uh, uh, quality of life. So is there anything you can do for someone like myself or someone like Brother Gregory that's trying to get that information and access to the people that can help them make a difference in their own individual communities? Thank you, hope, we'll hold that response. Next, right here. Hi, um, I have a concern about the bill that is proposed because when um, the young lady mentioned that the possible floor vote is in fall, I thought, yay, no. Um, my concern is, and please correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not used to, used to lecturing. Sorry, but uh, my concern is about the um, marijuana being completely dropped from the DEA schedule. Is that what I'm hearing? Because I don't see where that's gonna happen, especially since there is a divided Congress and we already know that there is a contingent of conservatives who aren't going to budge anytime soon. So would you be willing to accept a compromise where it's moved from schedule one to perhaps schedule two or three? and maybe that could also help alleviate some of the problems that you're having. Because I'm pretty certain that even if it passes the House, it most likely won't go through the Senate, especially if your condition is drop it completely from the schedule. Thank you. And then the final question here in the front. Hey. I'm an I'm a owner, but I wanted to say something about the um, the HBCUs in the state of Ohio, Central State University, which is HBCU, won a um, contract for testing, but they are not allowed to do it while other locations are because if they do, they will lose their funding for a Pell Grant. So this is the HBCU that has the chance to really rebuild and it just upsets mm -hmm. me totally. Mm -hmm. But um, my plight is, um, I really want to know if any of you are advocates for owners. I own a cultivation, three dispensaries, and my life has been pretty much um, total 
hell since, um, since the licensing. Um, first to come to the house, I had to prove that I was black. I had to get my parents' birth certificates. I mean, anything and everything. Had money in the bank, half a million dollars in the bank. Um, Huntington calls me one day and says, Ms. Kirkpatrick, um, we had to close your account. Now, my, I partners with a multi-state multi -state because, I mean, I'm, I'm a businesswoman and I consider myself a savvy businesswoman. So that was the way that I figured the best way for me to get in so that I could make opportunities for more diverse companies. What happened is, when I went to the bank, they called my partners, and um, I said, hey, you know, they're closing my account. And he said, oh, I just told them about my, I said, dude, you white, I'm, I'm black. You know, well, the same rules don't happen for us. So it's, I've really been trying to find an organization that can come to me, because I've been lobbying, I've been doing it on myself. My partners, they're, they're with me. They said, thank God they haven't left, because they're opening places all over, so they don't really need me. But they're committed to me, and that's why I chose them in the beginning. But what, which one of you all's organizations help advocate for someone like me? Um, I own three dispensaries, one cultivation site and processing. It's gonna be pretty successful, but I, I need some help, so. Thank yes. you. So just uh, as here, two questions about help, <laughs> resources that can assist people who are trying to help uh, individuals who are facing illnesses that need access to uh, what I hear is healthy and, and sort of tested products. And so just a quick thing about help, and then also maybe help with access to navigating banking rules and protecting owners who are trying to do it the right way. And then the second question about viability of, of ending prohibition and what we should be pushing for. So quickly, if we can go to Shanita and Gia possibly, and then viability, Marissa and Hawkeye. I would extend the Minority Cannabis Business Association to both of you. Uh, we're oh, an association, oh, wonderful. Yeah. Um, and so the benefit there is for you to be connected with not only uh, individual operators like yourself, but also those larger conglomerates like that are being formed now. So our members are, are made up of multi-state operators as well as smaller and medium-sized businesses. Um, and same thing for you. If you found your lane and now it's just about monetizing it, um, now it's just about uh, thriving, uh, I think you just have to get connected with some folks that can allow you to, to be the artist, the scientist, the healer that you are and help someone else create a business join with someone who can uh, help you create a business model that then allows you to build something that allow, you know, will allow you to not only do this good, great work, but to create something that's gonna be around for you know, generations to come. So uh, part of that, well, so to, to the sister front, I encourage you to come tomorrow morning, if you can, if you're able to, to the cannabis and banking session. There could be some folks in the, in the room um, that I may be able to connect you with. Sorry, I was told to talk into the mic. Uh, there may be some folks in the room that I may be able to connect you with. Uh, so I hope I, I'll see you tomorrow morning. I don't, know, I don't know which room, I don't remember, but I know it's on the calendar, um, on the schedule for tomorrow. Uh, but I know that it's 9.30 to 11. That said, um, to the uh, brother behind you, one of the questions I have, um, and, and I think it's interesting for any um, entrepreneur, are you a small business looking to just service your community? Are you looking to scale much wider and bigger? And the reason why I say that is not every business is looking to become a huge big conglomerate. Some are looking to become just that small community service. Uh, one of the things that I heard you mention is that you're, ed you're, re you're educating yourself as well as re-educating your community. Uh, and, and I agree with all the sentiments that um, Shanita said. You know, the reason why I mentioned the church earlier and I heard you mention your church is because I do understand how connected we are as people to our faith. Um, and I also understand that um, we are all patients of this plan. When we begin to shift the narrative and change the language, I think we'll all get it. We have no problem going to a Walgreens or CVS. Those are drugs, except they're just not scheduled, right? But when we begin to help our community understand the shift in what we were first initially were told, as the brother said, and then begin to re-educate ourselves and introduce just how are we using this from a medicinal standpoint. Your product is probably the healing 
for our community, right? But it may not hit across the country right away. I always say you start where you begin and you grow out from there. Hopefully that was helpful to you. Um, I can try to uh, get on the last question yes. around the liability <laughs> on descheduling. Uh, so just one, I think when we are thinking about our policy goals, one thing I really appreciate is like, us not leading just on what we think conservatives will allow us to get and leading on what we know we deserve. Um, and rightfully so, I believe the scheduling is the way that we need to go to rightfully end all of the issues that we have with prohibition. Um, and in the same way that you know this Congress passed bipartisan criminal justice reform, as nuanced as that whole process was, we passed criminal justice reform under this Congress. Um, and the same way that criminal justice reform is bipartisan, so is marijuana reform in Congress and across the country. And the more states that continue to legalize, the more it captures uh, members of Congress across the aisle. Um, and most of the issues that conservatives are concerned about are fixed from descheduling. So the issues around research, the issues around states' rights, the issues around veterans, all of those things are addressed by descheduling and rescheduling would not really address those things. So we're continuing to build out the fact that descheduling is a bipartisan thing. So we're leading our goals um, around the fact that descheduling is really what we need to fix all of the problems with prohibition. Yeah, and then just real quick, you know, we're we're pushing to win. My mind doesn't really think compromise, which is pro I'm probably a scientist, yeah, so okay, I'm <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, it's good that you're thinking about that. But no, like we we're pushing for full descheduling, and like I said earlier, I, I don't think descheduling is what folks have a problem with. It's more of the how. So I have a lot of hope, and we're going to push. And for us, a win will include completely removing from the Controlled Substances Act. Thank you. So one, I wanna thank all of you for coming out today and, and, and um, being a part of this really important discussion and providing your thoughts and feedback, but also your questions that I think has educated everyone in the room, including me. I wanna thank our panelists, Queen, Gia, Stanley, <laughs> um, Shanita, and Maritza for um, your efforts today in, in educating all of the room about marijuana prohibition. And just uh, just want to put a, a note to sort of uh, build on what everyone has said. I think we have to, uh, as we move forward, and when we think about the broadly reforming the criminal legal system, including ma ending marijuana prohibition, we have to center ourselves. And we have to really ask for what we want, and we often don't do that, right? We have to require our legislators and policymakers, who you all and all of us who vote, put into office, whether they are conservative or Republican, um, you put them into office and they work for you and you have to remember that. And so holding them accountable for the things that you care about, for the values that you espouse is, is really all of our duties as citizens of this country, not just citizens, but people who live in this country. So um, whether something is expedient or whether it can happen in the easiest way is not always the test for whether or not it's right and whether or not it's what we should be asking for. So I encourage all of you to contact your members of Congress and to ask them to support several pieces of legislation that we talked about today, uh, the Marijuana Justice Act, the MORE Act, the REAL Act that will remove um, uh, any uh, ban, excuse me, the ban for people with uh, certain arrests or conviction histories and people in prison from being able to access higher education, which is really critical to this conversation, and centering racial justice and equity for all. So thank you all. This has been a great conversation. I just wanted to mention, uh, I have flyers for that event that I uh, talked about. So if anybody's interested, definitely come grab a flyer.